A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob gave his sons this charge. Since I am about to be taken to my people, bear me with my fathers in a cave that lies in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, facing on memory in the land of Cana, the field that Abraham bought from Ephraim the Hittite for a burial ground. There Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried, and so are Isaac and his wife Rebekah, and there too I buried Leah, the field and the cave in it that had been purchased from the Hittites. Now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful and thought, suppose Joseph had been nursing a grudge against us and now plans to pay us back in full for all the wrong we did him. So they approached Joseph and said, before your father died, he gave us these instructions. You shall say to Joseph, (coughs) Jacob begs you to forgive the criminal wrongdoing of your brothers who treated you so cruelly. Please therefore forgive the crime that we, the servants of your father's God, committed. When they spoke these words to Jake to him, Joseph broke into tears. Then his brothers proceeded to fling themselves down before him and said, let us be your slaves. But Joseph replied to them, have no fear. Can I take the place of God? Even though you meant harm to me, God meant it for good, to achieve his present end, the survival of many people. Therefore, have no fear. (coughs) I will provide for you and for your children. By thus speaking kindly to them, he reassured them. Joseph remained in Egypt together with his father's family. He lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, and the children of Manasseh's son, Machar, were also born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. God will surely take care of you and lead you out of this land to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then putting the sons of Israel under oath, he continued, when God thus takes care of you, you must bring my bones up with you from this place. Joseph died at the age of 110. Ebum Domini. Be glad, you lowly ones. May your hearts be glad. Give thanks to the Lord, invoke his name. Make known among the nations his deeds. Sing to him, sing his praise. Proclaim all his wondrous deeds. Glory in his holy name. Rejoice, O hearts that seek the Lord. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek to serve him constantly. You descendants of Abraham, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he the Lord is our God. Throughout the earth, his judgments prevail. Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Gloria 
Jesus said to his apostles, No disciple is above his teacher, no slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, for the slave that he become like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more those of his household. Therefore, do not be afraid of them. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will be not made known. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light, which you hear whispered proclaimed on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without the Father's knowledge. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. Verbum Domini. extend a warm welcome this morning to our guest concelebrants. <clears throat> Father Thomas Rohr is a priest from Germany uh, stationed in Frankfurt. He will be with us this coming week taping a new series uh, for our German channel. As many of our local people and EWTN employees know, EWTN is preparing to broadcast 24 hours a day in Germany this fall. So we welcome uh, Father Thomas. And then most of you recognize Father Martin, who is an intern with us from Slovakia, a student at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. The rest of us are Americans. But to simply look at the uh, gospel passage, uh, this reference that Jesus makes, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. It's healthy for the Christian and for the believer to uh, reflect on the reality of hell maybe once or twice a day. And as one of the fathers of the church said, hell exists and you can go there. Uh, it's important for us to remember that it is possible for us to turn away from the Lord and that our hearts may become so hardened that we lose the promise of eternal life and that we, uh, this, the, the reality of eternal damnation is real. And so it's a, a sobering for the Christian to have that tinge of fear of damnation so we cling to the Lord. But now notice that I said to think of the reality of hell maybe once or twice during the day, especially before we go to bed each evening and uh, make an act of contrition and ask the Lord for pardon for our faults during the day. But for the rest of the day, for every other moment of the day, our, we should be consumed with thoughts of heaven and thoughts of our union with God and that he is such a loving father who desires to take us into his embrace. And this is what we hear referenced in Jesus' words, what I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you will hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Uh, this darkness and this whispering are indications of uh, our intimacy with the Lord, where we enter into that inner place, our hearts, and uh, where God dwells, uh, the triune God who takes up his dwelling in our hearts at baptism, and we live a life of union with him. 
In light of that, I want to look at the liturgical action. Uh, every action at the Mass is charged with meaning. And simply to look at our entrance into the church and this action and how we begin every Mass of reverencing the altar. If you think of yourselves this morning, the bells weren't ringing because it's too early here in Birmingham and we would have a violation of the city code if we were ringing the bells too early in the morning. And yet they go off right before Mass, beckoning everyone to come and to praise the Lord. And every one of us is called from every walk of life. The rich, the poor, and the middle class, the businessman and the tradesman, the tall or the short, the German, the Slovak, the Hispanic, the Italian, and the American, those of us, those of you who can sing and those of us who can't sing, some of you on your way to vacation, some of you on your way back home from vacation. But we all enter in and we enter into the throne room of our King. This is what happens when we come into our churches. What is called to mind, as you see, especially the entrance of uh, the entrance procession of the Mass led by the cross of Jesus Christ, is what's called to mind is the communion of saints. Again, all of mankind uh, invited and called to enter into this procession, this movement uh, toward heaven and this movement into heaven. And in the Catholic Church, what is center for us is the altar and the tabernacle. This is the place where Christ sits. In the church, the altar is where Christ is enthroned. And what do we do when we come into the presence of a king? We bow or we genuflect. We show a sign of reverence. This is what every one of you did this morning without even thinking about what you were doing. But we walk into the presence of a king who loves us and a king with whom we are in love. And so we come before him and we bow down, show a sign of tremendous respect. Another image that uh, we could use is the image of the bride of Christ. And so, uniting all of God's people into one, his church is the bride of Christ. And so here we come as this bride into the presence of uh, the royal bridegroom, into the presence of the one who has wed himself to us in love, who has laid down his life for us, who has redeemed us and saved us, and so the normal gesture between two people who love one another is that they greet each other with some kind of embrace or kiss, especially a man and a woman. And so in our faith, we are a young man, Christ, and a young woman, his bride, the church. And so the normal uh, gesture that accompanies uh, this meeting this encounter day after day when we come together uh, for Mass is that we greet the Lord with a kiss. And so what the faithful are invited to do is to unite themselves with the action of the priest. The, uh, the priest acting as the head of the body, uniting himself to Christ. But when the priest enters in, he bows down, he genuflects before the king, and he reverences the altar. The altar at that point and during the Mass is a symbol of Christ. And so we kiss the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, in the person of the priest, kisses Christ. And there is this greeting of affection that takes place at the very beginning, the very outset of the Mass. And you notice at the end of the Mass, the same thing happens. Just think of your day-to-day -day lives, those of you who are married. What do you do when, you, when a husband comes home? He gives his wife a peck on the cheek. When he leaves, he gives his wife a peck on the cheek. 
You know, and this is what happens with us in our familiarity with the Lord, is that we come in loving reverence of him, but that we are so deeply in love with him, and he greets us with a kiss. We greet him with a kiss. And then we enter into the action of the Mass, this most intimate union that we will experience on earth, the most intimate union with God that we will experience on earth is in Holy Communion. And what surrounds uh, that, uh, that event of our communing with the Lord is silence. This is the most sacred time of the liturgy. And so as we prepare for Holy Communion, we are silent. When we receive Holy Communion, we are silent. And our hearts are speaking heart to heart with Christ himself. We have this intimate communion with Christ. And it is in this that we hear the words of Christ when he says, what I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. This whispering or what is said to us in darkness is this silence and that moment of holy communion between, yes, each heart, each soul, and Christ himself, but in that moment of communion between the bride and the bridegroom. And these words of affection that are spoken heart to heart or to one another, spouse to spouse, you know, you can't articulate what those words are, and yet they are very deep and very profound. And then the Lord says, take from that moment of communion what I say to you in the darkness and what I whisper in your ear. Basically what the Lord is telling us is, I love you. you know, and we're told by him how he knows us, how he forgives us, and how he loves us, and he desires every good for us. Now, just like any young woman, this is where you need to, don't have to really use your imagination, but I've shared this with uh, those of you who come to Mass every day. You've heard me say this before. What does a young woman do who has fallen in love with this young man? She thinks he's just the greatest thing. And then he finally, you know, they go out on date after date after date. And there comes this moment when he finally says, you know what? I think I love you. And she says, that's wonderful. And then the very next day, if not that night, she texts everybody. She calls everybody. She goes on the rooftop and she tells all of her friends she broadcasts to the whole world, I'm in love. He loves me. You know? And everybody jumps up and down for joy. You know, we share her delight. And this is what the church does in her proclamation of the gospel. When we end the Mass, when we conclude the Mass, there is that, again, that sign of affection between Christ the bridegroom and his bride. That simple kiss of the altar, and then we're commanded to go out and proclaim the gospel. And the message of the gospel ultimately is, I know who the Lord is. I'm wed to him. This is what the church says. I'm wed to him. I'm united to him in love. And I want to tell you how much he loves me, and I want to tell you how much he loves you. So literally, we rejoice in this at EWTN, this command, what, I, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. That's why it's so important for us as we gather every morning uh, for the Holy Mass. And then many of our employees go next door and literally from the housetops. All of these little satellite dishes all over the place and radio antennas, we're proclaiming to the whole world what the Lord has told us in secret, what he has whispered to our hearts in love.